Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Thomas Chisholm. Remember, new shows are posted every Monday and Thursday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Now, before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show, CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with the Chief Market Strategist at WeatherShares LLC, Thomas Chisholm. Tom and I discussed how he uses weather patterns and solar cycles in his trading. He explains how weather patterns and solar cycles relate to financial markets, and wait until you hear Tom's thoughts on the current Fed policy during this solar cycle. We talked about the deficiencies of prominent dynamic weather models, temperature variance compared to technical patterns, and finally, Tom gives us his weather forecast for this winter and what markets he thinks will be impacted. Without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Tom. Tom, thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Anthony. Well, it's a pleasure to speak with you today, Tom. I have to say I'm very excited about speaking with you today because this is the first time I've done a show uh, on someone who chooses weather as their primary analysis to trade financial markets. So let's start off today by you just giving us a brief overview of what it is that you guys do. Okay, so our rough mission statement would be something as follows, and this, this is subject to change as, as everything is, as this is a process of discovery. But we, we say natural systems variance and its influence on human behavior and by extension, the market. So we recognize that what has been lost through time is the human connection to nature, uh, nature's influence on our behavior, and how markets are, are defined by that. We believe that the, the closest economic model uh, to our methodology is Austrian economics, meaning that there's a, in their estimation, this goes back to a kind of ancient wisdom that there are natural forces that are mysterious that are around us that influence markets through which uh, central authority and uh, you know uh, a finite number of people uh, probably do not get it quite right. That there are some things that we don't have control over, but that represent natural systems uh, variance within markets that, uh, if trusted, uh, regulate everything from bond rates to money velocity and the pace of human activity and demand cycles. And so that if we recognize through using measuring techniques, including analytic geometry, and understand how measurements of those are phasing or not phasing with financial markets, analytic geometry, we can predict with enough data uh, how uh, markets will be affected by changes in the weather and solar conditions. I mean, this is so interesting to me because obviously we all know of commodity traders that use weather to help determine pricing in the markets. But for financial markets, I can't say I've ever heard this before. I mean, I've heard of people using, you know, in the stars to help determine what the markets are going to do, but never the weather. Yes. Can you just share with us what markets are you guys trading? Right now, the, we're focused in two areas. We, we were interested during the fall in special uh, weather derivative individual securities. Our concern as of mid to late December was that the overall stock market may be going through its at least cyclical capitulation phase and that through forced redemptions and so forth, some of our individual um, securities that we've been investing in 
uh, may be thrown out with everything else. So we are taking more of a macro view and have been focusing on, for example, long treasuries, a uh, full disclosure, we are invested in TLT and natural gas. That's the most pres uh, uh, prescient concerning where we believe the natural systems variants uh, are playing out. Primarily um, right now on a, the solar side of things, we're looking at the fact that we are uh, very close to the bottom of an 11 year solar cycle. It is the, the fourth one in a row that has seen uh, a lower peak and uh, a similar low, but under those circumstances, money velocity tends to slow and as a consequence of that, along with um, the weather turning colder and increasing snowfall, the yield curve flattens, which is, I've been told by my financial people, if you can consistently forecast that, that that um, creates some alpha. <laughs> um, so we're very interested in that, and we've been predicting all fall that there was going to be a flattening, continue, continued flattening of the yield curve. We've been seeing since at least 1995 that there's a seasonal tendency for the yield curve to flatten during the fall as the sun goes quiet annually. And then you add on to that this um, advanced amplified uh, drop in solar output UV, which slows down human behavior and slows down transactional velocity between people. And um, that has a profound effect on the bond market through the flattening yield curve and a tendency for long rates to come down, and especially with Fed policy being that they're raising interest rates, we think that that process of the long rates coming, coming down is being amplified by what's going on with the sun and also with increasing cold and snow this winter. I want to dial this back a little bit so I can make sure I'm getting a clear view of, of exactly what you guys are looking at. So it sounds to me as though weather and solar are determining what markets you guys are trading. So as you said, you know, you're focusing on yield curves, treasuries, natural gas, even equities. And then you also mentioned Fed policy. So what I'm wondering is, are you guys also implementing fundamentals into your strategy? And also, are you using any technical analysis? So the answer to all of that is yes. So what we like to say is that um, uh, David Gress is our research expert, and he makes sure makes sure that we're not out of bounds on the fundamental side because I specifically don't do not have a professional or academic background in securities analysis, so that's where he comes into play. And we inter interface from the meteorology and science side with finance together, and so uh, part of the process of, of us coming along as a as a as a firm, a fledgling firm is to bridge the gap in lingo between what I talk about and what he talks about and, and to the trust building of that, that dialogue um, and mutual recognition of pattern, uh, pattern recognition. So we start with fundamentals to make sure that if we're doing individual stocks that they're not overvalued. Um, we attempt to make a distinction during the fall um, uh, by focusing in first on value stocks at this time of the year, staples and REITs and maybe some telecom and so forth. And so we make sure that our fundamentals are okay and the Fed policy is on our side. And then we layer the natural variance over the top of that because I don't want to be accused of having man with a hammer syndrome, meaning that I have a methodology that I think is the secret sauce and I'm looking around and going to apply it uh, you know, to anything and it's going to, it's going to change um, you know, the short term outlook and everything. I'm, I want to make sure that um, what we're looking at in the natural world represents a tailwind to what is already a favorable circumstance. Okay. What I'm gathering from this is, is that you guys are doing your fundamental homework. You're looking at a general theme of the market. That's your, that's part one. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Then you go that's exactly correct. And then you go and you step in and with you have a meteorologist background and you Correct. then look at weather and solar to see if that is going to confirm or contradict what you're seeing potentially in the fundamentals, ultimately telling you what markets you should be looking at coming from the meteorologist side. Am I right on this? That is correct. Uh, that is exactly correct. And let me add several other aspects to that. Okay. One of the techniques that we're exploiting right now, and we began with Veil Properties in, as an example, uh, we are sensitive to discounted cash flow. 
and forward-looking guidance coming out of earnings call. We know that in late, we knew that in late August, Vale Properties was going to come out with a uh, their earnings report, and that because of the of the um, vagaries of weather going forward, they would not be able to necessarily confirm what analysts would suppose would be uh, discounted cash flow uncertainty, and that um, also noting in market behavior that good news was turning into was not being reacted to favorably elsewhere. We decided at that point to avoid Vail properties. Um, and so that worked out. They immediately, when the earnings call came out, went down. So that was a win by not acting on it. Um, so that gives you uh, one example of, of how we um, use a negative divergence to our advantage. Conversely, um, we're also very sensitive. And I can tell you that during December, um, when mild weather had overspread the United States after a, a run-up in natural gas prices during the fall, when the cold came in unexpectedly, we used statistical methods to forecast how the weather is going to play out a month or two months or three months in advance. And by using statistical methodology that uses previous years as aggregated, as templates for what this year is going to be, we're able to recognize when markets are responding to weather models which don't use statistical methods. They use mathematics and dynamics to forecast the weather going forward, which is in our estimation inferior. Um, we believe that there's a bit of a bias on the warm side with the dynamic models in that they can't generate cold air that does not exist already on the weather map. The, the statistical historical methods that we use do do that. They, we, we believe that nothing is different now than it has been in the past. And so we look at all of the factors, about 32 of them globally, that are present now and compare them to how they have presented in the past and in, in different years and find the years that have the most significant um, uh, pattern identification with what's going on now, and then we integrate them into a model, and we say that's what this winter is going to look look like, despite what the government and other weather models might present. And this has been a classic example of that, uh, as that through December, they presented accurately that December was going to be mild, as it was in 2002, which is our primary analog year, and that but that January and February would turn brutally cold which, if we are correct, is playing out right now and will have a profound effect on natural gas and utilities and perhaps industrial production and other uh, elements of the economy that are affected by unusual cold and snow, which we think this winter will be, in particular in the southeastern United States and southern Great Plains. Sounds to me just like a trader would look at a previous technical pattern and say, hey, you know what? This may happen again. This looks very similar. You're looking at previous weather patterns and specifically what markets were impacted and how they were impacted. You take your current forecast and say, you know what? Based upon previous patterns, this may happen in these markets again. Yes. So we, in that sense, what we do is we create our own control base state where we say this is what the outcome is going to be. And then through time, we wait. So we're getting into the art of war if, in that sense that we let the enemy punch first and then we counterpunch. So we, we, let, we, let the, uh, we let the counterparty or the rest of the market respond and react to information that we believe is inaccurate. And we stay true in a disciplined manner to our base state saying, okay, the model is saying this. And so therefore, using the example of natural gas, they're going to sell off natural gas because they think that all of the cold has been discounted and now it's, it's time to fade natural gas. And they don't know what's going to happen for the, the rest of the winter, or they're believing the Climate Prediction Center forecast, which is basically calling for normal winter and above normal temperatures in the West, which we have consistently um, found to be contrary to our thesis, which is completely the opposite. It's going to be, there's going to be severe cold nearly coast to coast. So there's a distinct contrast between the government forecast and what we in the private sector are believing to be, have concluded is going to play out this winter. 
I'm with you on everything. I completely understand how you guys are going about using weather and solar in your trading, uh, specifically how you're using it for commodity markets. It just makes perfect sense to me. But what I can't wrap my head around uh, is how you use this for financial markets. So before we go any further, tell us about how you discovered using weather patterns to help you trade financial markets so it's an inductive process to some extent it's subjective and some of some of it is also very much common sense so i think about how i act and how my cohorts act and how different people act during weather changes how um, i pay very close attention for example it, with the michigan sentiment survey when they will come out with something in august talking about the consumer sentiment is x y and z and then i think about well you know what we're going to have much colder temperatures and snow is going to arrive much earlier in Chicago this, this fall than they know is going to occur. And that um, how they're going to act and how they, people think they're going to act oftentimes are much different. So that humans exhibit the same kind of hibernating behavior in the fall with, in response to what's going on with the sun as the rest of the biosphere does, the, re, the, the other mammals uh, at mid and high latitudes go through hibernating um, behaviors during the fall. That compels them to be concerned about the structures of daily life and making sure that their properties are shorn up and that they have proper food and so forth, and they're, they're hunkered down for the winter. Um, we do the same thing, and I don't think that it shows up in the, in the sentiment surveys in a manner that it should because people really don't know what they're going to do going forward. They're responsive to the, we the weather in real time. So. Um, that's the common sense of, of what we do and how we do it is to is to think about how the rest of the biosphere works and how we as human beings uh, mimic that despite what common data would tell us. So, for example, if you look at the long term charts, you'll notice that staples and um, certain defensive value stock, stocks, for example, utilities and staples and so forth, they tend to outperform during the fall. That's hibernating behavior. And then during the spring, uh, it's the antecedent conditions of how people act in the fall is how people act during the spring. So that um, you think spring break when, you know, uh, uh, people start buying boats, they start building homes. Um, if you notice that re recently there's been great concern over housing starts lagging. Well, of course they are. We're going into the winter and this is not really the buying season. Uh, housing stocks do better during the spring. Construction materials and economically uh, sensitive stocks do better during the spring. They don't do so well during the fall. So we have equal and opposite reactions in the fall in general, broadly speaking, over the long haul between staples and defenses and values, certain types of value stocks during the fall as composed to what happens during the spring. There's a rhythm to commodities, for example, if you notice that the, uh, the CRB has been rolling over. Well, I did some work on the CRB during the past, the past year, and a, a classical head and shoulders uh, top in commodity prices followed perfectly temperature variance, a flip-flop this year between warm and cold during the spring, hot to cool during the summer, a warm September and then a cold October, November uh, was correlated perfectly with the CRB. CRB this year was perfectly correlated with temperature variance across the United States and the demand for overall commodities, not just agriculture, but industrial metals and materials, materials and so forth, all correlated through human behavior with the temperature variance. I totally get it. So what you're saying is the role of the sun and the weather has an impact on people, which then has an impact on the economy, and then ultimately the markets. And like you said, it, it's, it's common sense, because I think that all of us as traders or investors, we understand uh, seasonality, right? I mean, when we, yeah, look yeah. At, when we look at how markets are reacting uh, or how markets are trading during specific times of the year, I too look at that. I guess it's because I've never taken it as deep as you have with the sun and the weather. But it, I mean, you're right, it makes perfect sense to me. But one thing I'm very curious about is I understand now 
what you're what you guys are doing but i'm wondering how do you manage risk using this type of a model because i understand that you're using fundamentals i understand what you're doing now uh looking at weather and, and solar but how do you narrow this down to where you actually can manage risk with this type of a trade so remember that i'm coming from a journalist and a science background and somebody who is um a a, 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 a what would you call it a, a nominal amateur, uh, extremely curious and uh, self-educated person in the financial markets. That said, I use the Sorkino ratio during the fall and I use the Sharp ratio during the spring. So we pay very close attention to creating, and we did so successfully this fall, creating a type of self-sealing uh, uh, model in the fall that regulates downside risk, deflationary risk during the fall, which we think was Amp was going to be amplified by the um, by low solar, falling solar, and the early onset of winter, plus Fed policy. We we believe that the Fed has made a mistake in tightening during progressively lower solar output. That the sun's kind of going to sleep and having reduced UV output already naturally correlates with slowing money velocity, and that Fed policy was piling on unnecessarily. Conversely, we believe that the Fed tightens when they shouldn't, but also loosens when they shouldn't. We find that they tend to loosen when the sun itself is causing money velocity by in increasing human activity to accelerate, that that's actually the time if they are going to be tightening that they should gradually do so. But they tend to start tightening late and then they tighten too quickly after the solar maximum. And we noted that uh, crashes tend to occur on the backside of solar 11-year si solar cycles when the sun is going quiet and they have tightened too far. Um, that happened in 29. That it was in a different had a different structure then, but it's ha happened at other times as well. So, Fed policy, the the understanding that the Fed, you know, almost unilaterally has tightened for too long, causing recessions. We believe is related to this problem of of the Fed not understanding natural cycles. I'll give you another example of this. There was a white paper that the uh, the Fed came out with uh, in May of 2015 after a particularly severe winter, for Q1. They made 271 mentions of the weather being responsible for various drags in the economy in Q1. Uh, what they said in that paper was that during Q1, when the severe weather was going on, they could not tell in real time how much weather was impacting economic activity in various sectors, in different parts of the country. They uh, make their adjustments in terms of guidance based on a normal winter. In the middle of that winter, they didn't know uh, how the weather was impacting the economy. It was only afterwards that they realized that it had, had everything to do with uh, the drag in Q1. And I would say there's evidence that there's been a drag in Q1 for 15 years because of progressively colder and snowy uh, winters in the eastern and central United States. It begs a question in my mind, and that is, is that why does the Fed not say even though in the aftermath that they will recognize that the weather has had such a, 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 an impact on the economy, why did they not at least raise the question before winter saying forward guidance by the Fed will be governed by the pending winter, whether it's warmer or colder? We don't know. I don't have an answer to that question, but I do have uh, would say they should say that. And I don't know why they don't. I don't know why the Fed does a lot of what they do, Tom, but that's for a whole You know, another, I mean, it really another, is interesting, though. Sure. Yeah, no, it, no doubt. Um, so a, a couple of things um, that I, I want to talk about more is just reading some of the things that you guys uh, talk about, and you talk about the deficiencies of a prominent dynamic weather model. Talk to us about that. Okay, so the, the first one is what I mentioned earlier, and that is, is that they don't allow for solar variance. They, they only key on what's called solar flux, or what's, that's sort of the, the, visuals, the visible spectrum of the sun, how you know, um, they consider that to be a constant. Um, it's evident 
to us on a statistical basis and other private sector meteorologists is that, no, the sun has a far more prominent role. Some of it's a bit mysterious to, to some, but the closest that we have is that when uh, ultraviolet radiation drops, the amount of heat that's being absorbed by land masses drops and it causes temperatures to turn colder. It also has an effect on the jet stream is that when ultraviolet radiation is less the creation of ozone drops in the upper atmosphere, and that causes the jet stream wavelengths to to uh, to shorten. Um, in general, when the sun goes quiet, everything in nature slows down. Storms slow down, the jet streams slow down, money velocity slows down, and when you in any system, whether you have a constant amount of money in the economy that's circulating around. If the velocity of money slows down, then the amplitude of the waves of where by demand the money is going to, the amplitude of those waves goes up. The same thing happens in the atmosphere. And so we're getting into how the analytic geometry of weather, meteorology overlaps with, um, with finance, is that the same thing happens in the atmosphere, that when wind speeds slow down, which is a proxy for money velocity, well, the amplitude of the jet stream increases and storms slow down in their in their movement from point A to point B. Not that the wind velocity within storm diminishes, but just their general movement slows down as well. And that's all solar related. So um, we recognize again that UV variance changes in ultraviolet output. Um, you know the amount of sun that people uh, are receiving regulates their behavior. Look at what happens when people who have been you know, hold up in the northern United States during the winter, and they've been not in the sun, all of a sudden go on vacation in Florida. Well, everybody's driving like maniacs down in Florida, right? And they're acting much differently on the beach in Florida than they do when they're huddled up in their, their homes in Green Bay, right, in the middle of the winter. That's the sun. That's coming back into the sun, uh, and people's behavior becomes much more accelerated during the spring in general, and when the sun is strong, than it is during the winter time. It's, it's a profound difference. Um, people have, of course, challenges with seasonal affective disorder because of a lack of sunlight during the winter time. And then their behavior becomes quite something different when they go to Florida or their vacation in the Caribbean and they're back in the sunlight. They're feeling much better, much perkier, and they're relating to one another in a much different way. Well, Tom, I live in Florida. And I could tell you this, <laughs> what you're saying makes so much sense to me because someone who lives here year round now, when all the snowbirds come down, which I was one of those at one point in time, come down for the winter, it's like nobody can drive. All of a sudden they're out here. Everybody's riding. Oh, everybody's exactly. at, It's amazing. Exactly. Well, look at the insurance rates in Florida as compared to Maine. The highest, uh, the highest, inter the highest insurance rates are in Florida and the lowest are in Maine. Is it because of the way people drive? I witness it firsthand all the time. Uh, I can never figure out why the minute it becomes winter down here and everybody comes down to Florida and nobody knows how to drive. I'll never figure it out. But uh, that's for a whole other show, uh, Tom. Something that I want to discuss with you, I think we touched base a little bit on this today, is comparing weather patterns or actually temperature variance to technical patterns. Talk to us about that. Well, it's really interesting. Um, let me let me attack that issue from how I sort of got to that, and it's it's the suddenness of with how how markets move. As to it seems to me that when you go into a bear market, um, and now this is something I'm I'm sort of ad libbing here, so I'm thinking it through as we speak. But at solar maximums, um, I'm thinking 1980 and 1982. When we go into bear markets, at uh, solar maximums, it seems to me that the market kind of rolls over. Um, conversely, at solar minimums, when we're, uh, we've got this issue with the solar, sun going quiet and sudden onset of winter, we get these very scary um, uh, drops out of seemingly out of nowhere. This past fall was kind of an example of that, that the markets really fell out of bed precisely at the time that um, far below normal temperatures came in. Um, now, this I'll, I'll mention this what caught my attention years ago was the famous video speech of charlie munger uh talking before the harvard business school or law school now charlie munger is really fascinating 
before he went to Harvard Law School, a lot of people not, might not know this, is that he was an Air Force meteorologist. And he was a thermodynamics major at, at Caltech, and he dropped out to go into the Air Force, but he was a meteorologist. And he said in the middle of that speech, it was one line, he said, everything is resolvable in the Pascal Triangle. And I went, what? <laughs> now that's interesting. And what he was basically saying, it's saying is, it's not just the Pascal Triangle, but it's something called the Sierpinski Triangle. And it is what happens in nature and when you have temperature variance is that, um, this gets into Tesla's work too, by the way, is that we're really an electromagnetic system. We are an electromagnetic system as people and a biosphere and also the physical properties of an iron core planet. And that means that we have alternating current that flip flops back and forth. People are looking constantly, I believe, for linear progressions. They're looking for exit and entry points based on a logical progression. And key reversals that happen in meteorology happen with great suddenness, seemingly out of nowhere. And they seem to not necessarily arrive from point A to point B, but they emerge out of nowhere right over us. And I notice that there's a similarity between how that happens in markets and how that happens in meteorology. For example, the, the flip to cold from mild in December is something that's playing out as a flip-flop. It's a bang-bang. It's like a bathtub slosh. And it plays in, instinctively and intuitively into that notion of how an alternating current system works. And I think that that's what Charlie Munger was referencing when you examine the properties of the Pascal or the Sierpinski triangle. As you, if you color code it and you progress through it, um, the geometry of the Pascal triangle inverts. And so you apply that into his logic of the value approach of Berkshire Hathaway when Charlie Munger says, invert, always invert, I believe that human sentiment with respect to the markets flip-flops in, uh, in a similar manner, and it has to do with how our brain symmetry works as, a, as part of this alternating current system, that it's back and forth. We assess risk, left brain, right brain. It's a tug of war between right and left brain, the flip-flop, and it makes us feel insane because it's very confusing until we get to understand how we can resonate with how the entire system around us is working and get in rhythm with it. And with respect to our own chatter and this sort of dissonance that goes on between right and left brain, if we can separate ourselves from our own propensity towards fear uh, and, and, and greed and act in a contrary manner to our own base instincts of how our brains are responding to what's going on around us, we put ourselves in a, in a, minority superior position man very interesting stuff about uh charlie munger now before we get into rapid fire tom uh, i want to talk to you a little bit about what you're forecasting right now can, can you share with us what you're looking at and, and i want to note to everybody look at we're recording on december 18th this show isn't going to air until January 7th. So no, no pressure, Tom, for, for being uh, <laughs> right here. But uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that we are recording a few weeks before uh, this will air. So it could be interesting. Maybe some of the things that you, you are uh, going to talk about uh, might be already uh, on their way to happening or happened. I would say no, um, um, this is not a risk. This is actually an opportunity. We are so certain in our forecast for the winter. And it is in the um, is contrasting what has been uh, a mild outlook from the government, um, and also as we've been recording this, a relatively mild December after a cold start with some uncertainty uh, for the future. But not from us. We have consistently said that there would be a back off in the most severe cold for a time in December. That was consistent with our other analog years, and true to, for example, the year 2002. And 2014 and 15, which is another analog year, we believe that the cold air is going to come back with vengeance. And in fact, this will be every bit as cold um, as 2002 and 2003 were. The cold will be more consistent and will be almost the opposite of what occurred last year, where we started off cold and then we ended up mild and we had the mild February. We believe it's going to be completely the opposite this year. But while very early December may see normal temperatures are slightly above normal, very quickly uh, the depths of winter will arrive and we're going to have a severe winter with temperatures 
far below normal and above normal snowfall from Chicago south and particularly in the southeast. And we believe the temperatures in the southeast U.S. for January and February and March may be as much as three to five standard deviations below normal with 150% of normal snowfall. That would include also the mid-Atlantic states. Of particular concern is for us is going to be the impact on natural gas prices, which we think are going to spike. Disclaimer, we are long natural gas ourselves. It's a full disclosure. Um, we also are concerned about the potential for brownouts if, with utilities and the potential impact on industrial output as a consequence of what may be going on with stra the, the strained utility complex. We also believe an addendum too that unlike other years that the cold is going to extend to the west coast which is similar to another analog year that we had was 1982 that we believe the very cold air is going to set up in the great basin and will also impact salt lake city and potentially denver so not only east coast cities and in the industrial east and great lake states but we believe that the intermountain west is also going to be impacted what about florida tom <laughs> <laughs> Am I glad to be well, down here right now? Well, I'll tell you what, this is going out in the limb. We don't have as much certain, uh, certainty about this, but we believe it is going to snow at least once in Atlanta, maybe twice. And we also believe that it's going to snow in Florida this winter, at least to the panhandle. Now, it's already, floated, it's already, it's already snowed in, in Houston once, and we believe the panhandle is at risk of a snowfall, and we'll go from there. I know that my understanding is, is that much of the orange crop uh, terrain down there is no longer insured, so maybe, a, maybe an orange juice freeze is not as much of a risk, but there's definitely the risk of a freeze in Florida this, this winter. It's a little Clarence Beaks information there for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, I, I lied when I said that was going to be the last question. I have to follow up on this. Because you've talked so much today about weather and solar for financial markets, and you just mentioned the, the commodity trade possibilities due to the weather. Is there anything you're forecasting that you see coming up for financial markets, whether it's equities, you know, bonds, treasuries? What do you think there? Well, what we do is we break um, the stocks that we're interested in. We take a macro view and then we dig down and we look at what individual stocks may, may be interesting to us. There was a second big sell-off in Vail Properties in December that we thought was overdone. And we think that that's a nice story stock to be looking at. We are interested in, uh, we're very interested in a stock called uh, Douglas Dynamics, which is a snowplow, snow removal company. Now they've been around since the 1950s and they have a great variability in their earnings, but they've been able to, to manage their balance sheet in a brilliant way uh, with great, uh, you know, they, they, their price action is very responsive to, to, uh, to national snowfall. And we think that they're gonna do well um, after the, the sell-off we, that we had. And we think they're very interesting for that reason, their ability to manage their balance sheet and variability, that puts them in a unique spot. We're also interested in Generac, um, ticker symbol GNRC. Um, and the reason that we're interested in them is for the potential for an ice storm. They did well during the, they do well during hurricanes. Um, if there's an ice storm, which is common uh, with during El Nino years, that's a hedge against an ice storm. And also this uh, daunting proposition of potential brownouts that people may be aware of that, that they could do well. Um, so those, those are three. Um, we, we, uh, we've been looking at Compass Mineral a little bit uh, as a stock. Um, Ross Dress for Less is another company that we're interested in because that's, uh, that's a fleece company. They're focused in the Southeast. Um, and then in the middle of the winter, we get into what we're calling the winter fatigue stocks. And those would include, for example, um, Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean, we think is the best in that group at this point. Um, we'll see how people respond to uh, the perception of lower household um, net worth with the housing sector stalling out. And we'll see how far this market correction has gone, whether they'll be influenced. But as a theme during a long winter, the the get out of winter dodge stocks become interesting to us. And then when we get into the springtime, we get into the reflation trades where we start looking at housing starts. We look at stocks, individual stocks such as Malibu Boat 
uh, if we have a sudden turn to better weather in the south during April and May, uh, when the when the, uh, the the boat shows are going on, they become get on our radar screen, and we don't um, we don't have any um, social biases or, or a comment about uh, people's vices, but we start looking at the cigarette companies because we notice that there's a seasonal um, there's a seasonal strength to some of the cigarette companies during the spring because when the sun comes back and people's serotonin and dopamine levels are are running out of control, people tend to self-medicate by smoking. And so you'll notice that there's a correlation between the price action of Philip Morris, for example, during the spring and summer, as opposed to their tendency to sell off during the fall when the sun goes quiet. Tom, I'm loving this chat today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing this great insight with us today, but we're not done yet. I have some rapid fun? fire. Isn't it fun? It's awesome. I really, it's great. Uh, and we're not done yet. I have some rapid fire questions next. If you're ready for those. Sure. All right, everyone. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by trading technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Tom, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? Uh, if he's a trader, I will say Charlie Munger. Um, so if he isn't, I will ascribe him the qualities of being um, a trader, and it goes to my notion of his understanding of the Pascal Triangle and how to create a, a discipline within myself with understanding the inverting nature of nature and how people respond to what's going on with systems around them. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? My own base instincts to be fearful, um, to be fearful when markets are going through a natural correction to fight the instinct to sell at the bottom like most people do. How has your trading process evolved over the years? Um, I've learned to step back from myself and to use my own um, reactive sentiment as um, rather than being an enemy, I use my uh, reactive sentiment um, as my master. That's how it's changed. What's one attribute that you believe every trader should have? an understanding of the natural world around them and how it influenced their psychology and their behaviors. What's your favorite book about trading? My favorite book was um, Stock Market Intelligence. What's your favorite movie about trading? Trading Places. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading? The best piece of advice that I have received about um, trading was actually from my father, um, who said that uh, those people that understood deflation and bonds are the ones that made it through the depression. The people that there were not solely invested in stocks in 1929, but understood that the role of, of uh, inflation and deflation during that time got through the uh, depression just fine. And that included some of our relatives. So that was the best early advice that I got about diversification. If you could give a piece of advice to the younger you, what would it be? The, the younger me would have been advised to stay with trades longer, to let my successful trades run longer, and to stay with my program of dollar cost and value cost averaging instead of abandoning it at certain points that I shouldn't have. Last question for today. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not trading? I would say just hanging out with my wife, playing with the cats and playing some golf. My life is pretty simple. Well, where can people find you on social media, preferably Twitter, uh, and give us a website to check out? Oh, please check out um, www.weather-shares.com. That is our new website. And my LinkedIn is simply my name, Thomas Chisholm. Tom, thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com. 
and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.